slide, please. Laura? All right, we're going to start. Yes, I, I was not able to unmute myself for a moment. Please go ahead and begin, Dr. Surrey. Okay. Hi, my name is Mark Surrey. I'm medical director of the Southern California Reproductive Center. And um, we're going to speak tonight a little bit about what is the most common problem with infertility in couples, and that is uh, infertility of unknown etiology, where uh, there's not a specific problem that can be identified by your doctor, and things just aren't working. So um, we're going to figure out how come and what to do about it. So firstly, uh, just to be uh, clear, um, Southern California Reproductive Center is a world-leading fertility center that specializes in diagnostic and therapeutic evaluations and treatments for infertility. And this includes uh, any kind of laboratory and or uh, surgical intervention that may be uh, necessary. So um, what we wanna do initially is talk a little bit about why this seems to be more and more common. So Laura, can we get started? Um, and my um, partner in this exercise tonight will be our physician assistant, Samantha Vaughn, who uh, works with us uh, in the uh, Santa Barbara Ventura area. And she takes care of patients in that vicinity. Um, and Samantha will be chatting with us a little bit later. So um, we'll get to meet her as well. So Laura, um, and uh, that's me. So let's, uh, and that's the office. The one on the left is the office in Beverly Hills. Uh, the one on the top uh, is the office in Pasadena, and the one on the bottom is the office in Santa Barbara, uh, which is also part of a surgery center and has its own uh, laboratory facilities. Laura? Uh, we can keep going, Laura, I think. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why this uh, issue is becoming more and more prevalent. Slide, slide. So uh, what the reason seems to be is that uh, more and more people are waiting until they're a little older to try to conceive. And so we see that under these circumstances, it takes longer to conceive, slide. And if you look at these slides, they're in proportion to one another, where the age of the female patient uh, is on the left. And as you see, fertility rates per cycle decrease according to age. And also on the right is an association that's very strong with the percentage of genetically normal eggs that occur as we age, they become much lower. And that's the reason why our fertility becomes much lower, is a decrease in the quality and the quantity of the eggs that are produced. Slide. And this is a natural process where you see uh, studies of ovarian tissue at birth at age 25 and at age 50. And you'll notice that at age 50, there are almost no eggs there. Um, and this is a process that physiologically and normally evolves with human beings. Slide. 
slide. So uh, let's evaluate um, fertility and uh, see how that will go. Um, when we look at the reproductive system, we see issues that should be evaluated to include the ovaries, which is where ovulation occurs, the fallopian tubes, which are transportation systems, the uterus, which is where pregnancy and plants, and then there is the male, uh, which we need to attend to and evaluate as well. Slide. When we look at what we call ovarian reserve, um, there is a marker called AMH or anti-mullerian hormone. That's a fairly accurate uh, marker of ovarian reserve. And you can see the way it works on this graph whereby it normally will decrease to a degree with age. But when we look at somebody, for example, who is you know, a single professional lady at 35, and we see that the average reading for ovarian reserve should be around two and a half to three and a half. And if it comes back at less than one, then that's a reason to uh, become much more proactive much earlier uh, in the idea of potential fertility preservation for the future. When we take a look at a couple in this same situation, uh, when the lady's ovarian reserve becomes lower, it means that it would be helpful to become more proactive uh, with uh, this process. Slide. So um, when we look at the transportation system, the fallopian tubes, we can look with an image that's done by an x-ray where a dye is injected through the cervix and a picture taken of where it goes. And you'll notice on the left side, the uh, fallopian tubes are patent, the dye falls through them. And on the right side, the fallopian tubes are occluded. The dye does not go through them. This is a process called hydrosalpings and is very commonly produced by infections. Um, and it's something that is not compatible with normal fertility, but the tubes have to be bypassed. Normal fertility is where the egg and the sperm fertilize inside the fallopian tube, and that's natural conception. So when that doesn't happen, uh, then we need to understand why. Slide. The uterus is able to be evaluated very adequately by an office procedure called a hysterosonogram, where we inject some sterile water through the cervix, sort of like a pap smear. And we can see on the left side, a normal looking uterine lining. And on the right side, a process that appears to be either a fibroid or a polyp in the top of the uterus, where a pregnancy would normally implant. Slide. Guys have to have an analysis done because uh, a lot of fertility issues have to do with the guy. And if uh, the lab that's doing the analysis doesn't do morphology, that's the structure of the sperm, uh, then it really is not adequate because a significant percentage of problems have to do with the structural integrity of the sperm, which has to be studied at a lab that specializes in this sort of an evaluation. Slide. So when we look at treatment options um, in patients, with a mean age of almost 38, because those are the kind of people that we see um, who have not been conceiving normally. And we look at different choices. And so one choice is, as you know, people used to say, well, just go away on vacation and, and see how that goes and relax. And that can work sometimes, but not very often. Uh, when we look at it again after unexplained infertility for more than one year. 
when we think about the idea of doing a treatment, uh, one treatment would be something called an insemination. And that's where you place sperm that's been treated uh, through the cervix so that we know that it gets to the area where it's supposed to go, which is the uterus, at a, an appropriate time. Um, and, and that can be effective uh, more often than doing nothing. Uh, clomiphene is a pill that helps with ovulation and, and people who take it, uh, we follow and monitor their ovulation so we can time it out. Gonadotropins are more natural substances that help with ovulation. And so people undergoing treatment with medications and inseminations can have a higher chance of success than people who do nothing. So it's frequent that that's the way treatment may start. But if we look at the next option, which is the in vitro fertilization option, you'll notice that the results are much, much higher. And that's because all of these variables that we cannot test or control uh, in vivo in a natural cycle uh, can be tested and controlled by the in vitro fertilization process. Next. So just to be clear, the insemination uh, happens as timed when an ultrasound shows dominant follicles and we can actually trigger the release of the follicle and time when the insemination should be. Next. Uh, the IV IVF stimulation is performed with natural releasing factors that are given underneath the skin so that people are trained how to do this and they need to be monitored for their response to this. So if you're doing IVF, you need to be available for around 10 days to two weeks uh, to look at your response to the stimulants. And this doesn't have to be done every day, but every few days. Next. Now we can see that on the ultrasound and on the left side, you see the way it starts for somebody with a high ovarian reserve. This patient makes a lot of follicles that you can see on the right uh, starting to expand. And further down on the right, you can see that there is a small needle that's inject, inserted into each follicle to aspirate the fluid, which will then contain the egg. This is done where a patient's comfortable uh, by giving some intravenous sedation so that you're not having a general anesthetic, but you do uh, have a level of comfort because you're essentially taking a nap um, while it's going on. And the process doesn't take longer than about 30 minutes, but you need to be in the center for probably a little over an hour and a half in total. Next. That's when we start to see information that helps us achieve a very high pregnancy rate uh, by looking at embryo development, which in a natural cycle, you cannot see. But with the in vitro process, we look at this in a laboratory setting uh, with a, a camera and an actual video recording device that shows us uh, embryo development. Next. And uh, this is what things start to look like uh, when the egg is fertilized. And on the left, you see two pronuclear cells. On the right, about eight cells or cleavage stage that happens after about three days. Below that are a couple of circles called blastocysts. And on the right is a hatching blastocyst, which is what needs to happen for an embryo to implant and also for an embryo to be genetically tested. Uh, that's uh, necessary. So um, 
next. Um, when we take a look at IVF success rates, um, the top bar is our success rate, which uh, decreases a bit with age, but not as much as natural fertility does, because as you can see, um, even at age 41, 42, there is more than a 60% success rate um, with implantation of a single normal embryo. Next. Uh, I don't know if you can play this, Laura, but this is the way we look at embryo development with a camera. This is a cleavage stage or about day three at eight to 10 cells. And then it starts to rapidly divide so that by day five or six, it becomes 100 cells and a blastocyst. This is a very interesting phenomenon. This process takes about six days, but we've shortened it up um, for just the next few couple of minutes here. But this helps us know which embryos are normal and which are not. And the ones that look normal then can be genetically tested. Next. So, you know, with all this technology, we also like to keep in mind that it's good to have sort of a holistic approach with mind-body integration. Uh, we encourage people to calm themselves because this can sometimes be very anxiety producing by eating properly, potentially meditating, or potentially some people uh, find that acupuncture is, is a very calming process. Next. So um, our team uh, consists of uh, seven different uh, physician providers, as well as a number of uh, nurse specialists and I'm going to introduce you to one of our physician assistant specialists, who's a, an excellent provider. She's with me here today in the Santa Barbara location, and that's uh, Samantha Vaughn. So I'm gonna just get Samantha for a moment to come and say hello. So this is Samantha Vaughn who's going to chat a little bit about uh, how she supports patients with uh, following their ovulation induction. Hi, my name is Samantha. I'm a physician assistant and I've been working in the fertility field um, for many years. I currently help Dr. Suri in the Santa Barbara office um, and I'm available remotely and in office to see patients and help with procedures. Great. So, um, Samantha, tell us what some of the most commonly asked questions to you uh, are. I think that IVF sometimes can be overwhelming and people are confused about how the process works. So I like to sit with them and talk to them about each step. Um, we talk about our uh, baseline ultrasounds and what those mean. We look at the antrophollicle counts and um, we do history out sonograms where we put water inside the uterus and we look for fibroids or polyps, make sure that the uterus is nice and clean to carry a pregnancy. Um, and we talk about the medications and how to use them. Um, on my team, I also have a nurse who helps me coordinate IVF cycles. So once we've decided that IVF is going to be the next step, um, you will have access to my cell phone number and my nurse. And we talk about um, scheduling appointments around dates that work for the patient and for the physician in the Santa Barbara office. Um, we learn uh, how to do the medications. We talk you through all the steps of mixing and injecting and we give you a projected calendar so you know everything to expect 
as you go through each step of the cycle. Um, IVF can take, uh, we, we anticipate and expect about a three month cycle. We do the egg retrieval one month and the second month is when we do the embryo transfer cycle. So um, what we'd like to see is if anybody has any uh, questions about anything, we're happy to uh, try to answer them now. Uh, but um, what we'd like to do is, is sort of open it up to any questions that anybody may have. And um, Laura, can you do that? The questions are available in the Q&A in the polls. Um, uh -huh. Samantha, if you'd like to read those off for, for Dr. Suri as needed, or I'm happy to do that as well. There's two, there's a couple questions already entered. And anyone else who's uh, participating, please feel free to um, post your questions in the Q&A or the chat. Okay, so- you wanna take the first question? Yeah, so the first question, how many eggs should a 37-year-old freeze for one potential baby? Well, that's, that's a good question. And um, the statistical answer to that is at least 12. And um, that obviously is going to change from person to person, but that's the, based upon the number of eggs from a 37-year-old lady who are going, which are going to fertilize and create normal embryos that are going to be genetically tested to be normal and then implant. So uh, that's the reason why uh, a lady of 37 needs an average of at least 12 eggs for um, an ongoing normal pregnancy. Now, you know, look, it's possible that you don't need that many, but um, that would be what we would recommend to be safe about it. At what age does a man's age make it more challenging to create healthy embryos? So um, it's interesting that men produce new sperm throughout their lives, uh, but obviously younger is better. And there is no one particular age that um, is a uh, problem that creates an absolute obstacle to fertility for a man. Um, and you may have noticed that men um, who are older are able to have pregnancies. There is some evidence that as a man ages over perhaps 55 or 60, that there is an increased incidence of, of things like uh, learning disabilities of the children. Um, and so that's somewhat debatable. Um, but there is some suggestion that that may be true. Okay. Does getting pregnant but having a miscarriage support that you are fertile and may not have issues with fertility? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because <clears throat> uh, miscarriages have lots of different reasons, but the most common reason in human beings is a genetic problem with the embryo. And that will happen more often as we age. So um, the fact that uh, a person is able to conceive is nice, but the fact that she's had a miscarriage means there's something not right about the conception. Occasionally, it's a problem with the person who's conceived, such as a, a malformation of the uterus, a problem with the hormones, like people that have thyroid problems, for example, are more likely to miscarry than people who do not. So we have an evaluation of miscarriages that includes looking at person's immune system, a person's metabolic system, and uh, the uterus. But 
the most common reason for miscarriage has to do with the genetic component of the embryo that causes the pregnancy. And as we touched on a little earlier, that becomes more abnormal as we age. And that's the reason why miscarriages become more common um, as we age. We got cut off here. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. How many IUI procedures will SCRC perform or recommend prior to starting IVF? You know, uh, there aren't any rules. I think that, uh, you know, this is a question that um, has an answer economically, it has an answer socially, but it doesn't really have an answer medically. Um, if I had to come up with a number, uh, it would be based upon statistical probabilities of a conception increasing with IUI procedures up to about three, and then they plateau and start to decrease. So if I had to have come up with a number, it would be three. However, everybody's different and it may be zero or it may be more. Uh, and that's where uh, the practice of medicine really becomes an art more than a science. You know, it, it depends upon you as to how many IUI procedures you should have. Uh, maybe you shouldn't have any, um, but um, if we have to come up with a number, it's based on probabilities, it's gonna be three. So how much is the average cost? Okay. How much is the average cost? Was something. Is it presumptuous to start IVF at age 40 after less than six months of timing? Well, I don't know what presumptuous means exactly, but um, you might say, is it premature? Um, and if you look at probabilities of conceiving with timed intercourse um, at age 40 uh, per cycle, as we touched on a little bit earlier, it's going to be less than 5% per month. Um, and the results of a normal embryo transfer uh, is really going to be in excess of 60 to 65% per month. So it gives you more than a tenfold increase in the probabilities of a normal pregnancy. So it's not really premature at all. And, and it, it also uh, needs to be influenced by your goals. Uh, for example, if your goal is to have more than one child, it would be recommended to start earliest and earlier than um, waiting for six months, um, you know, attempting naturally. So um, Samantha is uh, available to anybody who has questions or would like to have a consultation as am I. And um, you can find either of us through the SCRC uh, website. Um, and uh, we work primarily in the uh, West Los Angeles, Beverly Hills area, but Samantha is in the Santa Barbara Ventura area, as am I um, on occasion, uh, on a regular basis. Um, there are other doctors, Dr. Akopians and Dr. Wertheimer, who are more often at the Pasadena location. And um, we're happy to answer any further questions that you may have online um, or by a telephone consultation. So it's nice to have spoken to you today. And um, 
we're happy to see you at your convenience. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.